Welcome back once again to Little Guys, the show about little tiny computers that are trying their best. And this one, man, this this is quite a package. There's a lot going on with this thing. It's actually one of my favorite little guys that I've gotten so far, so I'm so glad you've joined me to take a look at it. Uh, this has, man, it's got multitudes, uh, uh, stories from, from many directions collapse into this object, which is funny because all of them are boring. It is It is an intensely uninteresting device to anybody who's not interested in it. Do, do you know what I mean? Either you're a gigantic nerd and you can get excited by things that you have no imaginable use for and then are, are completely out of your wheelhouse, or you're not, and I don't know what you're doing on my channel. <laughs> so this is an LG NC1000, and I came across this thing on eBay entirely by accident. I was looking for something else, I don't remember what, and I just stumbled on it, and I, <laughs> I mean, the front of it, looks pretty cool but then you flip it around and you look at the back and you're like whoa what what could be going on here it's it's obviously a pc right like with this port arrangement you just look at it and you go that's a personal computer that runs windows and well if you have any doubts i mean there is the windows embedded sticker right there so yeah clearly this is a personal computer but is that not one of the weirdest form factors you've ever seen for one I mean, we've looked at a few odd birds on this series so far, but I mean, this is just chaos. There's just ports everywhere, you know? There seems to be no rhyme or reason. Why do we have USB over here, but then we have USB over here as well? We've got a recessed USB, right? We've got um, optical audio, but then we also have analog, except it's like protruding into the case on the bottom, like, like they didn't really design it for this chassis, right? And uh, likewise for the, the memory card reader over here, that's just sort of, yeah, it's it's outside the comic frame. Calvin and Hobbes. Did Bill Watterson design this thing? I mean, what's up? And then, of course, we've got this thing over here that's got a little handle on it, so you can tell that pulls out. There's no question. And when I saw this thing in the eBay listing, I looked at that and I said, that's the computer, isn't it? That's the whole computer, and the rest of this is something else. I just know that the entire machine is in here, which immediately begs the question, if that's true, then what? what's all this stuff for? Why is it over here? Why isn't it part of it? Why does the computer unplug? Why are there <laughs> no other controls or indicators or anything on this thing? What the hell is it? I had to know, uh, so I immediately ordered it, and then I went and did some research. So... This is a digital signage appliance, and I think I've touched on this a couple times before in videos, but uh, just to be clear, uh, digital signs are, well, they're exactly what they sound like, right? When you go to McDonald's and the menu is constantly changing so you can't see the thing that you're looking for, you know, like you're scanning through the list of burgers and then it suddenly becomes a list of drinks, that's a digital sign. And of course, it's got a computer back there that's got to be cycling through uh, those menu items and it's going to have a schedule to tell it, you know, what time of day to switch from breakfast to lunch. And most likely it's going to be able to pull updates from some central server, right? These are all highly desirable things, of course. And I have to correct myself here a bit because in some earlier uh, episodes in this series, I made the assertion that all these digital signs just have like a normal PC on the back, like a Windows computer. I asserted that uh, they never run Linux and uh, that they're usually not centrally managed in any way, that they just have like a copy of TeamViewer on there. And whenever somebody wants to change the image on the screen, they just log in remotely and, and just replace the JPEG. Okay, so I'm not entirely wrong, okay? And in my experience, uh, up until the point when I said that, this was true because I kept finding little guys that had been used for that exact thing. They were just an ordinary, like an Intel NUC kind of thing, running Windows with a simple program to play a video file or a series of images. Uh, and indeed, they literally had something like LogMeIn installed. And I've since spoken to people, uh, quite a few people in comments, who have confirmed that there are many uh, digital signage and advertising applications where that is exactly what they do. But I've also been informed that there's lots of applications where they do things completely differently. 
there is a tremendously broad range of different kinds of devices used for this application. And uh, at the absolute bottom end of the market, you've got uh, what one person referred to as a JPEG to HDMI converter. Basically, a little gadget you can buy off Amazon that's just a box with an SD card slot. You put a, a card in it and it just reads the files and uh, converts them to an image you can plug into a TV and that's all it does. No smarts, no scheduling, nothing. Then as you move up in the market, you get into the sort of things I was talking about, like these Windows PCs that just run very simple, you know, slideshow software, but can be administrated remotely. But then as you continue going up, you get into like the really involved, dedicated, sophisticated solutions, and these get nuts. Case in point, uh, this video isn't even about this thing, but uh, eventually there will be a video about it because these things are really cool. This is a bright sign, and they're a company that's been around for quite some time. They make a ton of different digital signage players. Uh, they're pretty much all this bright purple, uh, makes them very distinctive. And these are not little guys. So this is out of scope for this series. You know, it does have uh, uh, some PC-esque ports on it, but as I understand it, this has an ARM processor and it runs Linux with a completely custom software stack. So. This device is capable of doing what I said, taking a series of JPEGs and just flashing them on the screen one after another or playing an MP4 file or whatever, but it can also do a lot, lot, lot more. I can't even begin to get into it in this video, uh, but just to give you an idea, you can do things like plug in an external HDMI signal and then superimpose live data coming from a server. So for instance, you've got um, some sort of local video feed, maybe uh, something else is playing video or you've got like a satellite TV box or something like that. And then you can have a banner superimposed over that that's got current prices, sales, a news ticker, whatever you want. Uh, it can output audio. Uh, it can actually uh, accept interactive control signals over uh, the network, over RS-232, uh, over GPIO. Uh, it actually has a ATSC television tuner. So if you wanted to have local broadcast TV uh, being displayed, and then, like I said, superimpose uh, uh, current information over it, you can do that. Uh, it even has IR out, so you can use this to control other devices. And uh, they even have this extremely sophisticated and in-depth uh, menu designer that allows you to build whole kiosks around these things. So you can have like a bank of buttons or a touch screen and people can come over and like navigate through a menu to find things at a mall or, or whatever. Like they just do everything you could possibly want a screen hanging in a commercial establishment to do all in one box with a unified software stack they're really, really, really cool devices. And I gotta put this one away before I keep talking about it. And those, of course, are centrally managed. So no, it's not all Windows PCs that people are using TeamViewer to get into. That thing does exist, but there's an awful lot of stuff that is not like that. And this machine is, is actually one of those. And I'm gonna fire this thing up later and show you the management software for it. But what I wanted to do first was actually talk about what this represented in the market, because it's actually quite intriguing. Let me go ahead and uh, uh, pull this gadget out here. I don't even need to bury the lead here. Like I said, I figured as soon as I saw this thing that this, uh, this pullout module was the entire PC. And of course, you're probably guessing that too. And of course, it is the case, right? Like, like duh, just, just look at it and think about what you've seen, your, your life experiences. Obviously, this is going to be the whole computer. Yoink. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You can tell, just just at a glance, you know, um, you've got all the necessary parts. There's the RAM, uh, this is the uh, the SSD, uh, the size of this heat sink in the presence of a fan suggests that there's a CPU under there, and we'll get into all that later, but um, yeah, suffice to say, this is an entire computer, and it just docks into this chassis. But why, why do this? Well, as I said, this is a digital signage computer. And the nature of those is that they're gonna be plugged into a screen that's usually hanging somewhere, like it's installed in in a public place, um, sometimes you know ab above the counter at a, a fast food restaurant, or sometimes like when you go to the mall and you see one of those TVs that's just like in the window of a store and it's, it's running a slideshow or advertisements or whatever. All of those have some sort of computer backing them. The, um, the display itself is typically a, a completely ordinary television that just has some sort of module plugged into it. And that's what this was intended for. You can see on the side, we've got these metal tabs here and here. Let me just show you the manual for this thing real quick. 
So this thing came with a set of rails and uh, this uh, guide, which you would stick to the back of a television. So you can see here, you, uh, you bolt this to the Visa pattern on the back of the TV, and then you can take uh, the NC1000 and just slot it into place. Then, of course, you just uh, loop the cables around to connect it to the TV. You know, you plug in your HDMI, you hook up your network if appropriate, and Bob's your uncle. And that's actually why we've got the uh, the recessed USB port on here. Although this can be managed centrally, you can also just put images on a USB stick and just plug it in there. And you wouldn't want that just, you know, hanging all the way out where it can get broken off. So they gave you this nice um, recessed USB port here, or you can just use the memory card slot, uh, or you can, um, you know, plug your drive in and, and hook up a keyboard and mouse and copy your files over to the internal storage. There's there's all sorts of options, right? But the idea is that this is the thing that attaches to the TV, and if, for instance, the uh, the computer itself should bite the dust, uh, then you can just unplug this and swap another one in. And obviously, you're going to have to do a little bit of reconfiguration. But for the most part, you know, it's going to be quicker and simpler than um, removing the whole thing that might be, you know, trussed up, hooked up to all these cables and whatnot. Uh, and of course, the power supply is still good, right? If just the computer itself has failed, then you just buy this module, you throw this one away and you put another one in. But here's the thing. I don't think that was the only idea that LG had for this product because if we scroll down here in the manual, then eventually we get to another section for the NC2000, another version of the same thing. And the accessories included in the box are much simpler. There's just the device itself, which um, well, you can actually uh, tell even from the image here that it's a little bit different than the one we have here, uh, and uh, a set of screws, and that's it. And the reason is, if we scroll down to the installation instructions, in these images, LG instructs you to take the metal blank panel off of your television and then insert this computer. And indeed, I have a pamphlet here for an LG commercial display M4716C. It's a fairly ordinary looking uh, display. It's pretty much just a computer monitor. Uh, it does uh, 1920 by 1080. It's an IPS display, 60 hertz. Nothing particularly remarkable for the most part, except that it says that it's PC built-in ready, NC2000 compatible. So this computer was made back in July of 2010. And as far as I can tell, uh, that is when this product hit the market for the first time. And that's kind of a shame. I, I think this is actually the, the beginning of what was supposed to be a whole lineup of different machines, which came out at exactly the wrong moment because I think that LG had the idea that you would be able to buy many different modules like this to suit different needs. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to to sell these as two different components if this is the only thing you can ever put in here. I made the quip about being able to replace the computer if it dies, but come on, come on, how often does that even happen? What I think makes more sense is that you would buy this chassis and then you could buy different modules to suit whatever your particular applications are. And the reason I say all this is because there's actually precedent for it. You see, this is an OPS module, and it is the realization of the dream that I think LG had back in, in 2009 when they first developed this. This is, in fact, a slot-in computer. This is, I think it's an i5, maybe an i3. Um, it's got all the, the bits and pieces you'd expect from a little guy. There's a, a hard drive in there. You can see the CPU cooler right there. Uh, we've got our HDMI, our USB network, audio, uh, but what makes this special is that it's got this connector on the back, and this allows it to plug directly into a television. You can go to a company like Sharp, and you can buy an OBS-compatible TV. And it will have a slot, uh, usually on the side, which will accommodate one of these modules. And all you do is just um, plug it in, put in two screws, and then it connects to the TV automatically. This interface here has uh, display port pins. It has, uh, I think, uh, dedicated audio pins, USB, uh, power, all kinds of things. And what's wild about it is that this is a standard. This was developed by uh, a consortium between Intel, NEC, and Microsoft, I think is what I read. Uh, and there are dozens of manufacturers making modules just like this uh, in all sorts of different sizes and capabilities. If you buy an OPS compatible TV, which are made by many different manufacturers, you can put this module in it, or you can get one that has an i7, or you can get one that's got a much lower power processor, 
or you can get one with an ARM processor that runs Android or that runs other proprietary OSs just for digital signage. Or you can get one uh, that just has an ATSC tuner. I'm not exactly sure why, but I guess it allows you to just turn your OPS compatible display that was not sold with a TV tuner because it's not intended for watching TV into a normal TV. Seems odd, but sure, why not? And you can even buy OPS modules that will uh, receive a streaming video signal over a network, like an RTSP signal, so they have no intelligence of their own, they're just a video sync. So there's tremendous flexibility in this stuff because it's all standardized. And this standard has been around since 2010. <laughs> Oops. I think that LG had all these same ideas. I think they imagined in like 2008, 2009, that they were going to sell all these TVs that had these um, these standardized, you know, NCX uh, interface module slots. And then you'd be able to buy these adapters to let you uh, make an, any normal TV uh, accept these things. And then they would sell you different tiers of system and upgrade cards. Uh, and uh, like I said, you know, just simple IP video receivers and stuff like that. And they finally got it ready, released it, and then like three days later, this standard came out and completely blew them out of the water. I'm completely speculating on this, but as far as I can tell, the NC1000 series didn't go anywhere. It's now discontinued and LG makes uh, their own OPS modules, they make their own OPS compatible displays. And what they've done is they've actually pivoted to making modules that run uh, WebOS, since they own that whole thing. And they've made TVs that just run WebOS natively, but are optimized for digital signage applications, so you don't even need uh, the OPS module to begin with. So LG has leaned in really hard to this standard, but I think that they actually got <laughs> obliterated by it in the first place, and that this is the only thing they managed to, uh, to get out before they realized how little sense it made. So to me, this is extremely fascinating. I had never seen this sort of thing until I started looking into these, these little guys and, and trying to learn more about digital signage. OPS is super, super cool, and one of my goals now is to have a collection of OPS modules. I want to have them all. I want to have the Android ones, I want to have the WebOS ones, everything. And the wild thing is that they're not that expensive, because you can't do anything with them without the displays, and the displays are super expensive. The only TVs that seem to have ever been made for this standard are like 75 inches and up, they're professional, they're thousands of dollars. Nobody seems to resell them. I think they just get thrown away when, when people are done with them. Uh, the few that are available still cost thousands of dollars and I'm sure they'll get destroyed in shipping. So I have this thing, but I've got nothing to plug it into. So I'd love to say that uh, everybody should go out and start buying OPS modules and having fun with them, but unfortunately, um, it looks like uh, that's not going to happen unless somebody, some enterprising individual, decides to uh, design like a dummy adapter we can plug in here, like a JAMA breakout board for OPS modules. It shouldn't be too hard. It's all specced. It, they're all basic signals. I could probably do it if I had the energy. Uh, however, for what it's worth, if there's anybody out there in like the general Pacific Northwest area who has an OPS compatible display, please get in touch. I really, really want one, and I can't afford to get one shipped here. I'm sure it'll get destroyed. But anyway, let's get back to the subject of this video. Like I said, this thing is, after all, just a personal computer. And I'd like to fire it up and show you the software because uh, it gives you a decent glimpse of what digital signage is all about. And I know that sounds super turbo boring, but you know, if you're the kind of nerd who watches my channel to begin with, you know, somebody who can be entertained looking at stuff that they have no possible use for, then I actually think you'll find this software kind of fascinating because it's the sort of um, doing something right that you don't usually see, the sort of generalized solution to a big, messy problem space. And I mean, with that said, I've been told by people who have actually worked with these things that they hate them, that the LG's entire digital signage product is actually just horrible and unreliable and miserable to work with. But you know what's great? I don't work in those jobs, so I don't have to care about that. I could just look at it and appreciate it for what it is. So let's get this thing uh, hooked up. I'll show you what it does. And then when we're done, we'll take it all to pieces because there are some really interesting things going on inside too. Now, this being an industrial machine, as soon as you apply power, it turns itself right on. There we go. And let's see if we can get into the BIOS here. There we go. Not that there's much to see in here, I just wanted to demonstrate that it is a, a perfectly ordinary computer. Uh, and the basic hardware, you know, we've got an Intel Atom 330, which is 
I think one of the earliest atoms. It's very, very old. It's also very slow. Uh, 1.6 gigahertz dual core, I believe. And we only have two gigs of memory. And I, I think that that's all it could take. I guess I could dig up a larger stick of DDR3 probably and test it. But uh, the thing is, uh, I'm a little unsure what the official capacity is because uh, on Intel's ARC for one of the early atoms that I saw in, in an earlier video, it said there was a maximum RAM capacity of only two gigs. And so I just assumed that was true. But then I got a bunch of comments on that video from people saying that they had that exact atom in various computers and they put a lot more memory in it. So I don't know if um, if that's the effect of using an external chipset with a RAM controller on it or if ARC is just wrong sometimes. Not sure. In any case, the specs for the Atom 330 specify next to nothing about the thing's capabilities. So uh, I have no idea what its maximum RAM capacity is. Uh, however, the uh, little SSD in there is 32 gigs, nothing special, and everything else in here is pretty straightforward. The only stuff that's unusual is uh, these settings down here. I feel like I've seen them before, but they uh, they do seem a little odd. The uh, the whole SMU um, PM control and, and thermal node stuff, I think that's just some like management hardware, but why is there a PMU JTAG option? I thought, I thought by definition JTAG was something you could use without any involvement from the machine itself. Somebody has an answer for that? I'm, I'm curious, curious what that does. But anyway, like I said, it's just a, a very vanilla BIOS. They have almost everything disabled. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into the OS. Oh, by the way, I do actually have the uh, original hard drive for this thing with the recovery partition. Uh, I haven't run it though, so I have the exact same software and files that the previous owner of this thing uh, was using, which doesn't amount to a whole lot, but I will show you some of it. Did you notice that the startup sound was a little cut off at the beginning? I have no idea why. That only happens on this computer. Now, naturally, it's running Windows XP embedded, as is typical for the time, and when you power it on, it goes directly into the uh, the last presentation that was... Oh, whoops. I forgot that the, uh, <laughs> the sample presentation I have loaded actually has music, and I strongly suspect that it's music that would get me, um, you know, copyright struck on YouTube, so I keep forgetting to mute it. Anyway, so this is what the thing does. It's loaded up a presentation. Uh, this is actually one I made, not one that the previous uh, owner was using, because as you can see, it's LG Fashion, and this is the premium item template. But as I'll show you shortly, this is quite a bit more than just a slideshow or a video file. This is sort of like a PowerPoint slide. Every single component on the screen here is a separate component. The text, uh, the images, the backdrop, uh, this is animated in like, um, in like a vector sense, rather than uh, like a pre baked video file. Uh, this is being pulled in from an MP4. Uh, the whole thing can be animated. There's layers. The text can be substituted automatically from a database file. Uh, the sky's the limit. But this is, in the end, only meant to be a passive device. So this is all it does directly. Like, you're seeing it. This is what the NC1000 is. Uh, and if we hit escape, then we just bail right back to the desktop. And it's a perfectly ordinary copy of Windows XP. In fact, um, What's kind of remarkable about that is is how ordinary it is. I've touched on this before, I think, but embedded versions of Windows differ from the normal consumer versions only in the sense that a vendor can decide to remove chunks of functionality from the OS. So for instance, uh, if you want to put Windows XP, which is normally, well, in, in this era, it would have been like well over a gig, I believe, uh, onto a machine that only has 256 megs of storage, then you can go in and remove Windows Media Player, um, all the accessories, Internet Explorer. Uh, you can remove whole chunks of, uh, not kernel functionality, but just about everything else. You can remove like the remote desktop service. You can take out um, crypto stuff, uh, just pretty much everything that is not essential to the OS can be disabled. But it, it seems like LG hasn't really taken advantage of this because it seems like most of the OS is still here. Like if we look in the start menu, we've got Internet Explorer, Outlook Express, Windows Media Player, and Movie Maker. Uh, if we go into accessories, all the accessories are here. Um, we've got, hell, we've got Hyper Terminal. We've got the fax system, right? And um, if we go in and take a look at the hard drive configuration, uh, there's there's some odd stuff going on here a little bit because there's two different partitions and uh, those are on that 32 gig SSD, but the C drive is only uh, about 1.8 gigs. And if we go in and take a look at it, we find that the overwhelming majority of that is actually taken up by the Windows folder itself. So like I said, they haven't really taken advantage of Embedded's ability to be, to be cut down. Now, 
there is a feature that's uh, built into Windows Embedded called uh, the Embedded Write Filter. And what that allows you to do is um, to basically uh, nullify any writes to a hard drive or a folder. So uh, they could have set this up so that the C drive is basically immutable. Like if I were to just go in here and start deleting stuff, and then reboot the machine, whatever I deleted would just be back because all of my changes were only being written into memory. And as soon as you turn the computer off, they evaporate. They never actually get written the disk, but they've not actually done that because I've installed software on here and it just installed like, like no problem. So I don't really know what advantage they get from running windows embedded here. It seems like this is just retail windows. It almost makes me wonder if whoever built this image at LG didn't really understand what the purpose of embedded was. Uh, but at the same time, I, I also sort of suspect that they couldn't really pare down on it because they need a lot of those features. For instance, I think the Internet Explorer is probably included because they wanted the ability to embed iframes into presentations so that your, um, your, your digital sign can load up uh, data from a web page. They're probably relying on the IE ActiveX controls and whatnot to do that. So you'd need Internet Explorer installed. Um, to play back video files, you would need the Windows Media Player controls and the codecs so they can't get rid of that. And while I'm not exactly sure why Windows Movie Maker would need to be on the player, I can imagine that it also provided things like, um, you know, transcoding ability or something like that. Uh, in fact, if we go in here and take a look in program files, there's actually a cyberlink directory with a copy of, of power DVD, and it doesn't actually have the program as far as I can tell. It's just the support files, presumably because they wanted the ability to play uh, DVDs, you know, through a, like an external reader, uh, or at least DVD files or MPEG-2 or, or something. So this is quite a heavy application, right? They couldn't really pare down the OS because they wanted extreme flexibility in the software. That's total speculation, um, but I'm guessing that's that's why it's so fat, as it were. I don't really see why they would have bothered with Embedded. Uh, they could have just gone with normal XP Home or Pro. It would have worked fine. Maybe the licensing was cheaper. All right, and my memory was correct. That Atom is a dual core and it has hyper-threading, so it shows up as uh, four logical processors. And that's really the only interesting thing about this hardware-wise. There's no no other specialty hardware of any kind. However, uh, one thing that was interesting is if we go into display adapters, you can see that it has an NVIDIA ION. Now, I had never actually heard of one of these um, before I got this device, uh, but it seems like it was kind of a phenomenon in the specific era of, of computers that I tend to be looking at, like the mid-late 2000s. Apparently, NVIDIA made this chipset that was used in a lot of like embedded devices and whatnot um, that was both a GPU and a chipset, sort of like, I think like the N4 series, but with, with a GPU as well. And uh, apparently people hate them, is what I'm told. Everybody I mentioned this to just goes, oh, God, an ion. So I don't know what sucks about them, but um, this is the first machine I've come across that had one. So that's interesting. Maybe you find that amusing. But this isn't really showing us what the thing can do. Like, yeah, OK, it played that presentation. What does that actually tell us? In order to understand what makes this interesting, we really have to look at the authoring software. Now, I actually have that installed on here and I could run it on this machine, uh, but I think what's much more interesting is to run it on a separate machine, a central management server, as it were. Now, obviously, if we're looking at a little tiny computer, we're gonna have to manage it with another little tiny computer. Enter the Dell D420. They shouldn't even make laptops bigger than this. I love the D420 because it's named after the weed number. I will point this out every single time that I use it. All right, so I've got these two guys connected through a, a network switch and I'm running on the D420. <laughs> That's the weed number. Uh, the LG SuperSign Manager. Uh, I should mention, as far as I can tell, SuperSign is the overarching brand for their entire digital signage uh, segment. And I think they're still using it to this day for completely unrelated products. Uh, anyway. This is the software you use to create presentations, uh, to remotely manage your players, to push presentations to your players, etc. So, uh, for instance, here you can see that, um, well, I named this thing Player 5 for some reason, but uh, this shows that we're actually connected to this device. And even if this were off in some other building, it could actually be connected back to the, the central management uh, through uh, a VPN or port forward or whatever. So I could have, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of devices spread across a whole bunch of buildings, campuses, whatever, uh, all manageable from here. 
Uh, so for instance, if I go click on player five, uh, it'll tell me information about it, right? We can see its IP address info. Uh, we can see that it's not playing anything right now, um, how much CPU utilization there is. And then if we pop over to the control tab, we can remotely power it off. Um, we can adjust a couple of options. Uh, we can send it a firmware update. A really interesting thing you can do with this, which I'm not sure what to think of, is create tile. If you've ever been somewhere and seen like a grid of monitors uh, with a single image stretched across them, the way that that's done typically in, in, in my understanding is that you have a, um, a matrix controller, basically something that plugs into VGA, DVI, HDMI, whatever, and it takes a single image and then it just chops it up, scales it appropriately, uh, and sends the individual segments out to a bunch of separate displays. Well, apparently, you could also do this by getting up to 25 of these NC1000 devices, or I guess NC2000 TVs with them built in, uh, hooking them all up to a single central management server and then sending them all the same presentation and then they'll just display little chunks of it. Now, I cannot fathom why you would want to do this. Like it, it doesn't really, um, yeah, it, it seems like it would cost five digits, something like that in player hardware. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. Why, why would you do this? I'm sure, however, that somebody out there could tell me why you would do this and will be so kind as to illuminate me in the comments because I am just, I'm just utterly lost on this one. But let's take a look at something more interesting. Let's go over to the, uh, the content editor. So from here, we can create presentations to run on these things. And it comes with a whole bunch of templates. So if we go to the template section here, uh, we've got uh, just some basic layouts, right? Uh, with various quadrants that you can populate with different data. Uh, but if we just go down here to one of their business type categories, they've got a whole bunch of prefabs for, uh, let's see, product information, special event, premium item. That's the one that I was running on there. Uh, but let's, um, let's pull up special event here. I should mention, by the way, this program is not terribly fast. And I think that that's because this is an Adobe Air application, I, I believe. Uh, and I don't know much about Air, but I get the impression that it's basically, um, what if you made Electron, except instead of using a web browser for the back end, you used like Adobe Flash. Because as far as I can tell, these things are made up of like SWF files. It, it literally sends an SWF to the, to the device. Um, and then those can have nested SWFs under that. And frankly, for like 2009, 2010, when this was first designed, that's a brilliant idea. Flash was still very much in, and it was a, you know, scalable vector animation system, incredibly flexible, extremely powerful. And while it was known to be a security problem, there weren't a whole lot of better uh, options at the time because web apps just hadn't become what they are now. Nonetheless, it was never fast, but it is at least extremely flexible. So for instance, uh, if we just grab an object here, we can drag it around. You can see that uh, we've got a layer system. Uh, these things can be you know, scaled in place. This is, I think, just a very high resolution image. I don't think it's a vector because uh, it says a photo over here. And this, by the way, this is what's called a zone. And it seems like these digital signage systems are generally built around this. The idea being that um, rather than just putting like a text object on the field, you create rectangles, which can be populated by text at one moment or can be swapped out dynamically with something else. Um, that's why um, earlier when I showed you that they had the, um, you know, the various just like rectilinear layouts, you would create one of these uh, that would split your display into like quadrants and then you could populate each one of those quadrants with some kind of media. And as far as that goes, uh, obviously we've got like some baked in photos here, for instance. Um, this one, I don't know, these uh, these like one plus one uh, badges on top of each one of these. I don't know if that's something the program is doing or if that's something that's baked into the, the graphic design. I can tell you, however, that the, uh, the text down here is just text, so we can uh, change the products to whatever we want. Um, likewise with the prices, um, I don't know why, I just realized the default prices here are $10.08 and $50.08. Sure, yeah, definitely, someone prices things like that, right? And then if we go down here to the library section, uh, this is our, our widget collection. These are all the things that we can add. Uh, so for instance, we could pull in some photos or videos. Uh, we can get a service here. We can import, like I said, we can have an iframe. We can have an RSS feed. Uh, we can put in like a custom HTML widget or a live date and time. 
and it sports video files, uh, embedded flash files. You can have it uh, uh, play music locally. You can have it display a PDF or a, a doc or an actual PowerPoint file, I think. So the sky's the limit, and I'm not going to bore everybody by going through every possible feature of this thing because it would take just hours and hours and hours. The point is, you do all this, and then um, you can hit uh, preview down here to see what it looks like. And you can see it when it loads in, it's uh, it's not like baking in a file or anything. It's actually sending uh, the raw SWF to the device because it has to then generate each layer on the fly. Um, and you can also see that they're doing stuff here. Like this is a vector animation. Uh, so presumably that's an embedded uh, SWF file. And on some other things, you'll see like a, like a, a bling sort of travel across stuff uh, that's also like a masked uh, vector animation. So there's, like I said, there's a lot of capabilities that this approach offers. But once we have the presentation ready to go, we just hit send to player. And if we're very, very lucky, this will work because the first three or four times I did this, it worked perfectly. And then after that, uh, I started trying to demo it on camera and it just wouldn't do it. Oh, but it looks like there we go. Perfect. That is exactly what we want to see happen. <laughs> Woo. So glad that worked. So this is what it does. And of course we can build a schedule here and we can tell it to load up different files, different times of day, different days of the week, different months, etc. It does everything you can possibly imagine that it would do. And then on top of that, it also has a feature where you can send broadcast messages or, or targeted messages. And this this is really interesting because on its face, it doesn't seem all that important, right? But when you start to think about it, it's it's actually very flexible. Uh, so for instance, suppose that I wanted to announce that there's a, a buy one, get one sale on plates, right? So we go in here and we design a message. And of course we can, you know, we can assign all of our various, um, you know, rich text attributes. You can tell it which direction you want it to scroll. You can have it scroll up, down, left, right, whatever, give it different backgrounds. You can make the background uh, transparent uh, if you want here. Let's give it something wacky. There we go. Oh, that is really ugly. Let's, let's try something a bit less offensive. There, that's bad. Uh, it gives you a preview of how it's going to appear on the screen. You can tell it how long you want it to appear, you know, for how many uh, days or for how many hours, minutes, or seconds. Uh, and then when you hit send, it just materializes instantaneously on the device. So obviously, like I said, you can use this to announce, you know, sales and things like that. But a very interesting application uh, that somebody uh, told me about, somebody who actually works with this stuff professionally, uh, they have a whole bunch of those purple bright sign devices that I showed you earlier uh, hung up all around some sort of campus. I can't remember where it was, a school, a business, something like that. They're all doing a uh, pass through to a local television station. So they're just basically TVs. But if there's an emergency, like if there's a fire or a chemical event or something, they can use this feature to cut off the television feed. Uh, you know, so it kills the audio, kills the video. So everybody looks up and goes, what the hell happened? And then a moment later, a message appears that says, you know, fire in the building, everybody get out. So yeah, if I haven't made my point already, these things are not useful just for advertising, just for marketing, just for, you know, menus at McDonald's. They are general purpose, remote control graphics display units, right? And the sky's the limit. You can do anything you want with one. And this one's very, very old stuff like the bright sign that's actually still being updated. Oh man, I, I got to stop myself from getting carried away with this because I really want to tell you all the stuff they can do, but I, I have to save it for another video. The point is that you may actually be interested in one of these things for yourself. You know, probably somebody out there, probably a lot of people out there watching this are going, oh my God, I could use that to solve this problem, that problem. The ability to set up a whole bunch of devices and then remotely put a full screen image with any anything you want in it, no matter how complex, and to on the fly send updates to it, that just screams possibility. And I know there's people out there that are excited, uh, but don't want to go out and buy an LG NC1000. They're like $50 on eBay, but you're limited to, you know, this device. There's only so many of them. They're many years old. Don't worry, because as it turns out, there is absolutely nothing that makes that device special. If you've been wondering, hey, w what is unique about it? What, what makes this an NC1000? What makes the, the SuperSign software run on here and not something else? The answer is nothing. And not only that, but it doesn't even try to enforce this. The SuperSign software is just a Windows program and you can run it on any computer. Case in point, I've installed it on here. And if I just come in here and hit play schedule, then it doesn't work because the last time I used it, I deleted its project file. One moment, there we go. 
I don't even remember loading this template, but apparently this is the last thing I was testing on here before I screwed it up. Uh, but yeah, I did absolutely nothing special to this laptop. It's just running Windows XP. Uh, and I just went and downloaded the software from LG's website. I didn't have to crack it. I didn't have to use Internet Archive, nothing like that. I just looked up LG SuperSign Manager. And that took me right to the download page for both the manager and the player. So if you're interested in messing around with this stuff, uh, then I invite you to go abuse LG's software. Now, in truth, I don't think you actually have to do that because I'm pretty sure that I heard that there was an open source digital signage package out there. Um, the website for it, I can't remember the name of the program, but the website for it looks like you have to pay for it, but you actually don't. Um, it's one of those... Um, those open source projects that's owned by a business. So they have to give it away, but they, they pretend that they're not doing that uh, with all these like subscription pop-ups. But if you dig hard enough, you can find the download for it. Yeah, and I can't remember which one I'm talking about, but I'm seeing that at least Zebo, Zybo, and Antheus are coming up in results for this. So it's something worth uh, looking into. You might be able to find uh, something that'll do what you want without having to rely on this ancient um, <laughs> Adobe Flash software. But I just thought that that was really interesting that LG had made no attempts whatsoever to lock this down. I mean, this is the kind of product where... I would typically expect this to be locked behind a vendor's only login. You've got to have a support contract, etc. No, no, it's just an EXE. You download it from their website. But now that we're done getting hype for digital signage, it's time to take this thing apart. Because as a computer, the NC1000 actually has a couple of interesting design elements and there's actually one huge boneheaded decision that I can't explain. So let's go ahead and get into this thing. We're going to take the computer completely to pieces. Obviously, I'm going to show you everything in it. Not that there's very much, but uh, this thing is, is actually almost more interesting. So we're going to do this first. I think I mentioned earlier, by the way, that these things are uh, little micro rack ears intended to uh, help attach this thing to the back of a TV. But to be clear, those are completely optional. You can use it without them, uh, which is why they, well, they're not built into it. Uh, you can just uh, set this thing on a shelf behind the TV it's connected to, whatever. Also, uh, one interesting thing about this chassis, you'd expect it to be made entirely of metal, or at least I would, because again, you know, this is going to get hung up over the, the counter at McDonald's. It's it's going to get beat up, right? It's, it's going to be used in industrial environments, and you just expect it to be super robust, but it's actually mostly plastic. It's all just sort of ABS, um, other than the... Um, the, the steel frame in here, but uh, if somebody were to drop something on this or hit it real hard with the end of a broom even, I think they could split this cover. Once the screws are out, the top cover just slides off. Uh, we've got our uh, metal EMI shield in here because the thing is, is made mostly out of plastic. And then there it is. And yeah, there's not a whole lot going on here. But what is going on is, is kind of strange in ways. So obviously we've got, you know, our power supply over here. That is a switching power supply, right? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Duh, duh. Uh, but we just got the open frame power supply here, naturally. Um, and because the electronics are exposed, they do have the case grounded, fortunately. Good, good. Uh, then the, the power output from there goes over to this board, which, of course, plugs into the computer itself. And this is kind of interesting because, obviously, this thing is essentially a dock. It's like a laptop dock, except that it's, it's just for these. But there are more connectors here than there are here. We've got matching plugs for the uh, the micro D sub here, and then we've got a matching plug for this white uh, two row thing here. But there's nothing matching this this single row like Molex kind of connector here. But what's really intriguing about that is that there's a cutout in the heat sink that would accommodate that plug. So it seems like this heat sink was designed to go on a version of the board that had a connector in this position, but that would not be this board. There's no um, there's no alternate pad there that would allow them to to put another connector here. So presumably they were imagining having, you know, several other variants of this. I have no idea what would have gone through this connector. I'm not up to, you know, reverse engineering circuitry in that way. However, what I noticed is that uh, this thing is clearly not as complete as it could be. Like I said, this thing basically serves as a docking station. So it's taking various signals coming over these uh, cables here from the PC, and it's just splitting them out to these ports. And I'll give you some more detail on that when I take the board out. Uh, but it's not fully populated. 
We've got an enormous chip here with a ton of pins on it, clearly something quite sophisticated that's not installed. And then we have another chip over here that would have been BGA. And then on the back side, as you'll see, there's some pads where there could be memory chips. So this was intended to do something quite a bit more sophisticated. And I think that sort of explains why this uh, analog audio connector ended up all the way down here, you know, jutting into the, the lower half of the case, because if we look, where that installs, there's actually a pad there that could have a, a fairly high pin count connector. So if they'd put the um, the audio jack on the top, there'd be nowhere to put that. So there seem to be accommodations here for some design decisions that they, they decided not to go with for this model. Uh, not to mention, um, this is bent because you have to bend it to get the board out, but um, this mount here and here seem to be there to accommodate either another board or a larger board. So. Yeah, there were going to be variants of this, but as far as I can tell, this exact module is the only one that was ever made in the NC series. So we'll never know what those were going to be. But anyway, let's uh, get this board out and take a look at it. Oh, right. Every single time I do this, I forget. You gotta take these, um, these jack screws out before you can remove the thing. All right, so we got the board out and it's not gonna show us a whole lot more. Um, like I said, there are these spots on the bottom where there could be RAM chips, uh, but what it is showing us is the complete lack of, of anything else on here. Maybe with these two chips, this board could have had some active function, but uh, by and large, all that's on here is just passive components. This chip here, that is a controller for the memory card reader, but that's all it does. Uh, this one here is a level shifter. That's for the serial port. It pushes the uh, three volt uh, signal from the um, the controller on on the chipset up to 5.5 volts, I believe. And on the back, there's just a um, this is a quad two input NAND gate, I believe. And that's it. And that was treating me kind of weird at first because this cable here, this looks like a VGA cable. It's got the shielding of a VGA cable, and we know uh, that this thing has VGA. It's got this port here labeled D sub. That's a funny little thing, by the way. A lot of Asian computer manufacturers don't use the term VGA. They just say D sub, which is specifically incorrect, of course, because both these connectors are D sub. They're just different, um, different pin counts. But I wonder if this came about as a sort of a trademark dodge because the term VGA that we typically use for uh, the analog video connector on PCs is actually an IBM term and I'm sure they trademarked it. So perhaps at one point they were trying to avoid uh, using the term, which seems kind of weird, right? It's not like IBM was going to sue anybody over it, but still, I can't think why else... Uh, uh, given that these are electronics manufacturers, surely they knew that D-sub was a, a completely inaccurate term, right? Because they were putting 9-pin connectors and 25-pin connectors uh, on machines uh, a decade before VGA appeared. So I don't know how it happened, but it seems to have stuck. There are still devices in the industrial market in particular being sold now that say D-sub to mean VGA. But at any rate, uh, this cable here sure looks like the D-sub cable because it's got the, uh, the heavy shielding. It's got all these little tiny wires. Uh, some of those look a little thicker, and I suspect that they're micro coax. This is exactly what every internal VGA cable I've ever seen looked like. It was this little wafer with these little spring clips on here and the heavy shielding. Uh, and the trouble is that if that were just VGA, it would leave nowhere for all these other signals because we've got... In addition to the video, uh, we've got at least two USB ports. We'll come back to that. We've got uh, optical and analog audio. We have serial, and then we have at least one uh, USB signal to talk to the memory card reader. And then whatever this thing would have been, we would have needed somewhere to, to communicate with that too. And there just aren't enough wires. Uh, this cable coming over from this board here, well, at least two of those wires are gonna be power and ground uh, because that's how this board gets connected back to the power supply. And then uh, besides that, we only have eight wires remaining. We could run two USB channels over to this board, but given that there's no USB hub, that wouldn't be adequate. So I just couldn't figure out where all those other signals were. And, you know, I was making the assumption that they weren't in this cable, but then I counted the pins and there's something like uh, 25 or 30 there. VGA only needs 15 at most. And in reality, it's, it's fewer than that. I can't remember what the minimum number is, but um, fewer than that anyway. 
and um, there's definitely enough pins here to run all those other signals. So I tried unplugging it while the thing was running, and sure enough, um, the USB ports on here went dead. So yeah, it's weird to mix high frequency uh, digital signals and analog signals in the same cable, but that's apparently what they did. Very, very odd decision. At times, this whole thing feels almost like, um, like, like sort of a a prototype, you know, like something that they let the engineers make, um, that wasn't really supposed to go to production. And I sort of feel like, because this was the very first version of this thing, that that's basically what it was: rushed to market, not a hundred percent nailed down. And they would have done things very differently if they'd put out another version of it. But of course, well, we know what happened instead. Now, going back to those USBs, as I said, there's a funny story going on there. You can probably already see what it is, but in the front here, we've got uh, this USB connector, which of course uh, mates up with this cutout here. But then behind it, we've got this triple stacked tower of connectors and only one of them is exposed and it's the one up here. Now it's probably pretty clear why that happened. I don't think you can go out and buy like a pick and placeable connector that's just a single USB that stood you know, nearly an inch off the board. That might be a full inch, actually. Don't know what that is in centimeters, but come on, I mean, an inch, about that much, all right? Uh, I don't think they could have bought that. And they could have taken a normal single connector and suspended it up there, but then they would have had to put a standoff or two here and then make another board and then solder a cable between them. You know, it would have been a whole lot of handwork. Whereas this, well, you don't need the lower two connectors, but the total cost of the whole thing was probably five cents, right? And you can have it pick and placed. So the robot just stuffs this in the board. Now, are the other two connectors wired up? Well, I have to admit that I have taken this thing apart about 12 times and every single time I've forgotten to test, you know, because obviously you can't reach them with the thing put together. So I don't think I need to. I think we can guess that either they aren't wired up or they're wired up to the exact same positions. Um, in any case, this is very clearly just a cost savings measure. Uh, but it's it's a really funny one to just Amontillado two USB connectors up inside of there to save four or five cents. Oh, and you know what? I almost forgot this. Uh, the one other thing I was going to point out in here is this connector up here, which I strongly suspect is just wired directly over to this one. And again, I don't have any idea what that does. But now that I look at it, I can actually see how yeah, the traces from there go under here and, and up to there. So... No clue what that's for, but clearly they had the idea that this would, would have a different board over here and you would put it in a different computer uh, with different capabilities. So they had big things in mind. But with all that out of the way, we'd better take apart the computer itself. It's really honestly kind of the most boring element of the whole thing, but um, I know you want to see it, so let's get at it. I love how this thing is built. It's this uh, sort of cordwood construction. Everything has to be taken out in a very specific order because everything is in the way of everything else. You can't take the heat sink off the CPU until you take out the RAM, and you can't do that until you take out this board, and you can't do that until you take this off. So uh, it, it's a very, um, very tightly packed kind of uh, sardine approach to building a computer that you don't see very often. So this is the SSD, and I'd like to take a moment to comment on these. This is what's called a half slim SATA drive. I have no idea where that name came from. I'm not sure if it's a standard or just a de facto thing. Um, I have no idea what it means. These are pretty much exclusive to industrial devices as far as I know. I don't think I've ever seen them in even the crappiest uh, consumer gadget. Uh, but because these are industrial and because they're uh, uh, de facto, I think that some companies define the form factor a little differently than others. So for instance, if we just look up half slim SATA, then we find stuff that looks exactly like this. That's obviously the same drive. But I happen to know that if we add a pacer to the name, and they are apparently a huge manufacturer of uh, in specialized industrial uh, machines and SSDs and whatnot, they make a version, which they also call half slim, except the form factor is completely different. It's actually narrower, it's shorter, and instead of the uh, the four corners, it just has one big fat mounting hole right there. But they still call this half slim. And I actually have another A-Pacer drive kicking around here somewhere that's a bit bigger than this, and it appears to have no specific name, but I wouldn't be surprised if they called it like three quarters slim or, or who knows what. So if you're ever trying to buy a replacement drive for one of these industrial machines, just be careful. Look real close to the pictures. Make sure you're getting the right thing. So with that out, we now have access to uh, the screws for this board. And I love this board because it, it does so many different things. This is the riser for the hard drive. Uh, it is apparently the riser for the HDMI port. 
and it holds the battery that's that's glued on there so if you don't have this then you have nowhere to put the battery well you also can't operate the machine so i mean duh right uh-oh nope oh, lost the screw Ooh, where'd that go uh hmm oh there it is Whew. so this guy pops right out uses one of these little tiny baby mezzanine connectors and by the way i have no idea what these pads are for the only thing i can think of is that they're basically um they're, they're they're like pogo pins they're like meant to ground the thing against this uh presumably grounded case below it i haven't checked that with a multimeter but that's all i can think of they're clearly touching down on uh, a ground plane uh, i don't know what else they would be for except maybe uh transferring heat but the ssd doesn't touch the board so that doesn't make any sense so yeah i have no idea Boop. Now, I love the routing on the fan cable here, and by that, I mean I hate it. This appears to be what was intended. I think when I took this thing apart the first time, um, it, it had never been opened before, I don't think. And this was how the cable was routed, just through the heatsink fins. Now, okay, the sink is not likely to ever get hot enough to damage that insulation, and these aren't going to interfere with airflow enough to matter, but it's still just a weird kind of unprofessional way to do it again this thing feels like a prototype right um in addition if uh, if i pull these cables up like this if they're not pressed all the way down oh well it's not gonna do it this time is it here let's uh well if we get this up here really really it's just not gonna do it now i i took this thing apart and put it together a dozen times and almost every time there we go the fan runs into the cables and then it can be really hard to get them to tuck down again to a point where it won't do it. Of course it's behaving now. I guess I must have reformed them. Anyway, uh, now that we're here, we'd like to take the sink out, but we can't do that because the ram is in between the sink and the fan. You can see the sink actually extends down below it. I'm not sure why, but it does. So there's no way to do this. Uh, it's a, a chicken and egg problem. The only solution is to actually unscrew the fan itself, which you do by sticking the screwdriver between the fan blades. I have found no other way to do this. Uh, it's really awkward because you gotta rotate the fan blades into the right spot. It's easy to take apart. It's not so easy to, uh, to put back together, let me tell you. Um, but then, once you take that out, you find out that only two of the three legs were actually attached. Again, just feels very bush league feels very uh, almost hobbyist uh so now we can take the ram out there we go no idea what the sink is over here for uh, i also don't know why this hole is here i don't know what that does that seems to um actually penetrate all the way down through the bottom of the thing so wow hey wait a minute there's a missing screw there's actually supposed to be one more screw on the heat sink that's not my fault i didn't do that I don't think. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's intriguing. But now we've got all that crap out, we can go ahead and remove the heat sink itself. And lay bare um, the whole inner workings of this thing. Now, there's a couple intriguing things to see at this point. Uh, first off, so this is the Atom CPU here, right? And the Atom, if you're unaware, is uh, essentially supposed to be like a system on a chip. Um, sort of like um, like a Snapdragon processor or something. It's supposed to be uh, an Intel CPU, much like a normal x86 processor, like a core you know, i7 or whatever, except that instead of requiring a whole bunch of external support circuitry, it has almost everything it needs on board, and it only needs very minimal external components to function. Well, in this case, they have equipped it with the NVIDIA ION, and uh, I'm not going to try and, and disambiguate this because it's a rabbit hole I don't want to go down, but basically, I don't know what this chip is doing. I know that the NVIDIA ION is uh, normally a chipset, that is, uh, it provides the bridge between a CPU and many other components and I.O. devices on a motherboard. It sometimes sits between the CPU and the bus, like the PCI or PCIe, um, and provides access to like SM bus sensors and stuff like that. But I know that an awful lot of that got integrated into the Atom. And I know that the ION can also be a GPU on par with, I think, a GeForce 9400 GS at one point. So it's possible that all this is, is just a low cost, low power GPU, uh, or it could be the chipset for the machine. I'm not really sure. But what I can tell you is that the, the thermal situation here is kind of unfortunate. Um, the Atom has received this very nice copper lump that's been, uh, I, I guess, 
epoxied, I think, into the aluminum sink. Yeah, because I don't see any, any other way of mounting it. So we've got this copper slug that's attached here, and you can tell that it's interfacing very nicely with uh, the Atom, but the NVIDIA Ion, all it gets is the bare aluminum. Now the thing is, this seems to be going all right. You saw it was functioning okay. You know, it's got the, the thermal pad on here. Well, here's the thing. I put that thermal pad there. Let me show you what this looked like the first time I took it apart. When I flipped the heat sink off, the first thing I noticed is uh, the impressions from the two dies on the atom, on that copper slug, they looked great, but there was just a hunk of tin, uh, thermal interface material, that like pre-deposited clay-like uh, thermal compound that manufacturers like to put on their heat sinks uh, above where the ion went with no visible dye imprint in it, as in it wasn't touching. And the thing is, there is a gap designed into this system, as far as I can tell. Um, when I took this thing apart earlier, uh, I managed to get a, a picture where you could see that there's light actually shining between the chipset die and the heat sink. But this isn't uncommon. Manufacturers frequently design uh, gaps like these into their devices so that they can use thermal pads or very thick uh, layers of uh, very heavy uh, compound, like that tin material. Well... In this case, it looks like they did that, but they didn't get it thick enough because very clearly the die was not touching it. There was no imprint in the tim, and the die itself had a bunch of nasty yellow thermal compound that was obviously dried out and had, had just baked for years and years in this thing's waste heat because it was not being effectively cooled. This thing was made in 2010. That seems to be the original tim, so... I think I'm the first person to get in here. And given that I found files on this device from 2019, I think we could safely say that this thing was running for nine years with no cooling on the chipset slash GPU. That's incredibly depressing. Now, the first time I took this thing apart, I thought I was super clever, so I just put a big uh, daub of thermal compound on there and put it back together, and yeah, that, that didn't work. When I next took it apart, I noticed that um, it hadn't actually spread the compound out to the edges of the die. Whoopsie, I've, I've since learned my lesson. When there's a gap, you have to use proper gap-filling material. So uh, I then tried to put it back together using this pad here, which is, I think, about two millimeters thick. And you can actually sort of see, I think, that uh, that was too much. You may have noticed earlier in the video, in fact, that the fans in this thing were absolutely screaming, and then at one point they just went silent. That was the point when I realized that um, I had probably put too thick a pad on there, so I stopped the camera, I took the thing all the way apart, and I swapped it out for this, which is, I think, a one mil pad, uh, and it seems a lot happier with that. So this seems to be what they should have had on there in the first place, a one millimeter layer of a thermal compound or a pad. And I don't know how it came to be that they put the wrong thickness on there. Now, one theory I have is that possibly there was supposed to be another slug over here, because I do notice that there's mounting holes that, um, well, no, because one of those is for the fan for sure. And the other one, that's right, we saw that hole in the board. So no, that can't be it. I don't... I. I think it was just supposed to have a thicker layer of compound. And that begs the question, did they screw this up on all of them or was mine unique? Uh, did they sell thousands of these NC signage devices that are all sitting out there as we speak, baking their uh, their chipsets to death? Or I, I guess not to death, right? Because it, it made it this far. Again, it just feels Bush League. It feels like they rushed this thing to market, didn't finish designing it, didn't properly test it. It feels super, super weird. Like, like not a product that LG would make. Now, having said all that, I just realized that I um, I referred back to the video that I found on here from 2019, uh, which I forgot to show you when I was demoing the software earlier, uh, but I have footage from a, a previous take of this video. It, it's real straightforward. Apparently, the previous owner was some company called Paragon Fabrication, whose business was Advanced Specialty Fabrication, basically uh, one of those companies that makes custom, like, welded steel trusses for trade shows. Uh, they also apparently did uh, some, like, built-in furniture and decor for or a church, and this was basically just a pre-baked video slideshow, which I think they actually made in Windows Movie Maker, so it's very possible that they actually did make it on this device itself and never had uh, a management system at all. But that's pretty much all it was. Uh, it doesn't seem like they had a presentation set up. They hadn't leveraged any of the advanced features of this thing. They didn't build the slideshow in it. 
uh, which is actually a shame because another thing I forgot to show you, because there's so much to that software, but the manager software actually has a timeline feature. So once you put objects on the canvas, you can actually drag around uh, their start and stop times and put transitions in so that as it's sitting there, it can do animations without things needing to be pre-baked in like Adobe Flash or anything like that. So like I said, very, very sophisticated device that unsurprisingly was being used by somebody who either didn't understand or didn't appreciate or, or just found its advanced features overwhelming. So they basically just turned it into a, um, you know, an MP4 to HDMI converter. And hey, you know, who can blame them, right? If it's what you have, um, use it the way that you're familiar with, right? You don't need to learn a system that's overly complicated if you have a perfectly good way to do it. So I respect that, but it is funny to me and it makes me wonder how many of these things ever got used for their intended purpose uh, versus how many were just sitting there converting JPEGs into HDMI. But let's call it no more tangents. At this point, I think I've shown you everything interesting about this device. If you want to know more about it, you can just go find the manual online and, and read about its capabilities. Um, maybe just grab the software and play around with it. It's it's great fun. Uh, and maybe look into some of the other stuff in this industry because uh, it, it seems like a really wide field with a lot of interesting capabilities. You might find something out there that, uh, that solves a problem you didn't even know was solvable. Uh, and like I said, at some point, I'm going to do a video about those bright sign devices, and I think that's going to be a whole lot of fun. So anyway, I hope this one was fun. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming along. I know this was kind of long and, and rambling, but um, I wanted to show you everything because this is sort of the foundation, I suspect, for a lot of other videos. I don't intend for this to become, you know, the cathode ray do digital signage promotion channel by any means. Uh, but this is just, I don't know, it's an interesting field to me. It's one of those unseen, invisible corners of computing. These devices that are everywhere, but nobody even knows they exist. You notionally know that all those those TVs at the mall and whatnot have computers behind them, but you've probably assumed that they were a lot simpler or a lot more complex than they actually are. And in truth... Yeah, this stuff just, it doesn't look the way I expected it to look. So I'm having a blast exploring it, and I hope you are too. And if you enjoyed this, then consider subscribing to my channel. I put these videos out pretty frequently. I have a ton of little guys, so I'm going to be doing videos about these things pretty much forever. You can expect this to be a regular uh, feature on my channel indefinitely. Um, unless I start losing subscriber and I'm forced to move it to my side channel or something. I have a side channel. Did you know that? It's in the... It's in the description on my channel. I don't put much up there, but I've started to put some more videos up there that aren't um, aren't really fit for the main channel, if you ask me. So maybe go subscribe over there as well if you just like hearing me talk. But if you really enjoyed this and you want to make sure I can continue making stuff like it, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people are doing. This is my full-time job, so these folks are buying my gas for my car and groceries and paying the rent on my studio and whatnot, and that allows me to just spend every day trying to figure out how to make good videos for you folks. I hope I'm doing a good job. And it seems like a lot of people are liking this series because I've been getting all kinds of donations. It seems that a lot of people have little guys hanging out in their basements and garages that they got from work or, or found in the trash and been carrying around for years because they don't know what to do with them, but they can't bear to get rid of them. I totally get you. So fortunately, I've gotten a lot of these things for free from viewers, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. But still, I find them on eBay, I find them in local stores, and I just got to grab them. And I can only do that because of the budget that my patrons give me. So I want to thank you all so much for making this possible. I couldn't do it without you. And everyone else, thanks for watching.